好，大家聽唔聽到 ？Hello， 聽到，聽唔聽到啊？大家聽到。Okay. Oh, very good. Hello, Vincent. Oh, okay. Okay, everyone. Welcome to the last CPD of the year. So, as everyone know, the confirmed cases recently has、um, increased quite drastically. So, we have decided to switch this conference to an online Zoom format. So, for sorry for the、um, sudden change. So, some housekeeping rules. Please turn off your mic for the meanwhile, so not to interfere with the conference. And If you have any questions you want to ask our speaker, please、um, save them towards the end because we do have a Q and Q and A section at the very end of this conference. So today we have Dr. Zhang Sing Bai Jian. He's one of the radiologists at、um, HKAI Hong Kong Advanced Imaging, and he's experienced in the field of radiology for over a decade. So he had worked with multiple hospitals and is actually the consulting consulting doctor at the、um, radiology department in those hospitals. Is that right?、Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So John, will you tell us more about yourself and the topic of today?、Uh, okay, I'm a radiologist,、uh, special interest in the skeletal imaging and also neuroradiology. So today's talk will be focusing on the important incidental finding that. Uh, we saw for the、uh, from the MRI X-ray that you guys referred to us. Okay, so without further ado, let me show you the cases. So all these cases are actually review of the 2020 cases, and they are all referred by chiropractors. And there are a lot of incidental findings that deserve early clinical attention. And on average, each month. We receive、uh, at least one cancer case and one benign tumor case from you guys. But there are also cases of chest infection and also other benign processes that can mimic tumor. Okay, let us discuss on the imaging finding, the pathology, and also the investigations and further management of these cases. So the case spectrum would include X-ray, MRI, and also CT. So these are these are all cases referred by you. So you may find some of these images very familiar. So let's go to the X-ray first.、Um, so have a look at the、uh, of the X-ray film. This is a typical EOS whole body、uh, X-ray film. What do you guys see? Can you can you can you guys actually see the X-ray images on the screen?、Uh, please, yes. So there's a、um, opacity in the right proximal femur. This is bordered by thin ring of sclerosis, and there's no cortical disruption. They can't see the X-ray. Can, can, can only see the PowerPoint. Cannot see the X-ray. Okay. Can we、uh, move the move the hand a bit? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. So this. Thirty-five-year-old young man presented with back pain referred to to us、uh, EOS X-ray examination. Incidentally, we found an opacity, a lesion in the right proximal femur that is bordered by thin rim of sclerosis, and it looks pretty benign on X-ray. There's no cortical disruption, dis disruption, no soft tissue penetration. So it's probably a benign,、uh, benign finding. So MRI heavy with contrast is suggested for further evaluation. What do you guys think、uh, this may be? Okay, let's look at the、uh, MRI finding. So this lesion is again bordered by thin thin rim of sclerosis. This thin black line here, and this lesion is pretty bright on T two, and on T one it is. 
hypointensity is actually similar to the signal intensity of the skeletal muscle. And on post contrast image, you can see the thick rim of enhancement. So what says about this is it is pretty benign, it is growing slowly. That's why we can see the thin rim of sclerosis instead of cortical disruption. Because if the lesion is growing rapidly, that would we would see cortical disruption than this thin rim of uh, sclerosis. But then something unusual about it is this thick rim of enhancement that makes it is less likely to be a bone cyst. So I also put in the differential diagnosis of a giant cell reparative granuloma, which is another benign finding. So just to be very safe is that I suggested to correlate if there's any clinical symptoms, such as any pain, and then follow up radiograph in three to six months to ensure stability. So let's go to our second case, a 68-year-old man. So X-ray thoracic spine. What do you see if we look beyond the spine? Can you guys actually see the, the, the X-ray on the screen? Okay. There's a lung nodule. There's a lung, lung nodule in the right lower zone. So what could that be? So as I said previously, that we, on average, see one malignant neoplasm and one benign neoplasm from your referral. So that's all that CT. So there are multiple lung nodules in both lungs. And look at the margin, a pretty speculated for these, look at these. So what could this be? Can this be lung metastasis versus a primary lung tumor with multiple lung metastasis? So this is a mid image. We can see these nodules, nodules, nodules. So it would be in the line of multiple lung nodules for further workup. Because these nodules has irregular margin that making, making, making it less likely to be lung metastasis. So I'm actually thinking about primary lung tumor with intrapulmonary metastasis. And the next step could be either biopsy or by PET-CT to look for primary lesion. So of course, we suggested uh, PET-CT first before doing something invasive. So this is the PET-CT whole body mid image. So the lung nodules are actually not that hot. So here in the right lower zone, that is the, that is the lesion we saw on X-ray, but then there are multiple, multiple enlarged lymph nodes in bilateral axillary region and also both groins. Um, there is no abnormal marrow uptake. What could this be? Probably uh, pathology involving the lymph nodes, for example, lymphoma. And so the lung nodules would probably be lymphomatous involvement of the lungs rather than a primary lung tumor with multiple intrapulmonary metastasis. So, how to confirm? How to confirm that this is the case of lymphoma? So, at that time, we suggested to do a biopsy under ultrasound guidance. And this is the groin lymph focali biopsy. So I put in the needle, took multiple cores of tissue out, and then sent to pathologist. So these nodes are actually pretty irregular with thickened cortex. So, but then the shape is preserved. So it again speaks for lymphomatous, uh, lymphomatous disease rather than metastasis into the lymph node because the architecture of the lymph node is preserved. And the histology came back to be a typical lymphoid lesion. So it could be an early Hodgkin lymphoma, low grade lymphoproliferative disorder. So the measurement would be referral to the oncologist. Let's go to the next case. Another EOS. And again, there's 
bracadic opacity over the right mole as well. Here. It's very subtle, but then there's some density additional. So on CT, we saw there is some haze and it's over the right mid zone. So it is a case of chest infection. So how to confirm? We should give the patient antibiotics and then follow up CT low dose line to see if there is any resolution of this opacity. If there is clear resolution, then no worries. It's just chest infection. If it persists, it could be something else. It can be tumor. So I want to illustrate that it's the importance of following up the patient radiologically for progress, for resolution of radiological abnormality. And this case, also EOS, low spine, APU. What do you guys see outside the spine? Anything abnormal in the lungs? So right upper zone, yes, uh, loose folks, uh, this could be, could be something else in the right upper zone. So let's lower it up and do a CT. So what we saw is there is calcification of the right costochondral junction. So it is a benign finding, but then, but then we should uh, do a CT to confirm. Otherwise it could well be a lung nodule. So for this benign finding, no follow-up will be required. So brief summary is for chest abnormality, we have seen benign conditions such as infection and also malignant conditions such as lymphoma. And we've discussed about the imaging finding, the investigation and further management. Let's go to the next modality, MRI and cervical spine. So let's spend some time on this mid-sagittal T2 weighted image of the cervical spine that you typically see. When we look beyond the spine, what else do we see apart from the degenerated discs? This very subtle finding is in the brain. How about the pit? How about the pituitary gland? There's something hiding here. That is unusually T2 bright. And we blow it up. So he said that there is something abnormal at the, at the posterior aspect of the pituitary gland. And what could that be? So further investigation like MRI of the pituitary gland has been suggested. And we look at that carefully. This lesion does not enhance. And it's located between the anterior and posterior lobe of the pituitary gland about 0 0.6 centimeter. It is a uh, rafiki classic. This location is classical and it's a benign finding. So usually most, most patients don't have any symptoms, no hormonal problems. But then if there's a large system, it can compress onto the optic chiasm. And in that sense, the patient may need circle removal of the lesion, like a transphenoidal endoscopic approach. Okay, in our case, let's look at the same location. What can you guys see? Okay, another pituitary gland lesion. It's an enlarged pituitary gland Patrogenous with some cystic component. If it's larger than one centimeter, it is a macroadenoma. In this case, would require neurosurgical referral. So this lesion could cause some hormonal dysfunction and also affect the vision. It is compressing onto the optic chiasm. So another case is a showcase of, for, the, for, the, for the sake of completeness. For this 55-year-old lady, the pituitary gland is pretty large. It is more than a centimeter in height. It is abnormal. 
So then it is this bulky that there's no compression onto the optic chasm. The optic chasm is this horizontal, horizontal line. But then still, it is too big for our age. So MRI of the pituitary, pituitary gland would be helpful for further evaluation. Now, how about this C-spine? Anything, anything uh, on this right sagittal MRI of the silver spine, do you spot anything abnormal? <clears throat> the septic, this two bright area in the middle cranial fossa, that is cystic. And this could well be an anagnosis. But then we would uh, need further, further evaluation, such as MRI of the brain, before we can say for sure there is a, an anagnosis. Also, see on this sagittal, mid sagittal MRI of the cerebral spine, we saw a lot of lesions the pituitary gland, the the brain, and also this time, it is in the nasal pharynx. What could this be? This lesion, 2.71 centimeter in height, situated in the nasal pharynx. So in our locality, we have to exclude nasopharyngeal carcinoma. But of course, it could be something else. It could be benign adenoid. But then we have to ask the ENT surgeon to take a look inside and do some biopsy. And so on the ball, we can say it is an adenoid rather than a superangial carcinoma. So another case of MRI cerebral spine, we see intradural extramedullary lesion that is slightly hyperintense on T2. It is impressing on the record and is placing towards the right side and this way. And the most common lesion in this area that is benign because it's not, the spot is not that irregular. Okay, it is impressing onto the cord without loss invasion into it. So the most common pathology would be a meningioma, especially for elderly lady. And the next lesion, one of, of course, this is the case for neuro, neurosurgical referral. And it's associated with NF2 neurofibromatosis type 2. Let's move on to MRI lumbar spine that you guys refer to as a lot. So this is a 58-year-old lady with low extremity numbness. What do you guys see on this type of mid sagittal T2 and also axial axial cut of one spine? If we look beyond the spine. Anything? Let's spend some time on the actual image. Spot anything? So we look at the if we look at the uh, central canal, it's pretty patent, right? It's no nerve root compression. And look at the mid-sagittal image. There's some disc bulge, but there's no significant central canal stenosis. But then we look further, we see a lump here, which is pretty big. It's like a five centimeter, five centimeter big lymph node, retroperitoneal uh, lymph node at L1211. So it's suspecting about lymphoma at that time because of this large lymph node. And then, like the prior case, I suggested the PET CT. So let's see the, the, the past CT, this is what we saw. Okay, so this is the CT part, axial cut of the patient, and this is the MIP whole body image of the patient. So there are multiple, the multiple enlarged retroperitoneal retro lymph nodes along this chain. So what we saw previously at L12 level is probably this lymph node. This one, and there are multiple enlarged lymph nodes along both sides. And further down, there is a large mass that is very hypermetabolic. Okay, so this is the right ovary, and this is left ovary. This is the uterus. So it is a case of gynecological malignancy with retroperitoneal lymph node metastases, and this that causes the patient's numbness in the lower limb. 
So for a lot of cases, we need MRI before we can, we have to exclude certain uh, important things before we can say the patient is just having a disc prolapse. So MRI could help us in solving these cases. So how about this 64-year-old uh, lady, MRI lumbar spine, axial cut. Central canal, there's some disc bulge, some ligamentum flavor and hypertrophy in the cell of So if we look beyond the spine, what else can we see? In the middle. So this thing. This thing is located at the head of pancreas. It is a cystic lesion located at the head of pancreas that deserves for the workup. Okay. So we actually suggested MRI of the upper abdomen, but the patient probably defaulted because I don't see any follow-up scan for this patient. So I would be thinking about cystic pancreatic neoplasm, which include introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, IBMN, and other cystic neoplasm of the pancreas. And simple cysts of the pancreas is actually rare. So most cysts that we saw in the pancreas are actually not benign and require further monitoring and workup. So for side branch, introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, if it is more than three centimeter, would require resection. This lesion usually grow pretty slowly. So we need uh, a regular follow-up like the yearly follow-up to monitor the size. That's another recent case that I saw. So patient with back pain, some degenerated disc, this L5S1, L45. Okay, how about this lesion here? Any suggestion? Does that look like a tumor to you? Mm, it's possible. And uh, okay, and look at the disc. Look at the disc, and also look at the look at the edema associated with it. So this modulated tissue bright lesion extending from the disc into the left psoas muscle, causing a lot of swelling in the left psoas muscle. We were suspecting psoas abscess related to disguises. So how to manage and further work of this case, we would suggest contrast enhanced MRI. To look at the disc and also the, the this T2 lesion better and other sites of involvement. But then uh, I found uh, no further imaging for this patient at this moment yet. So we'll see whether there's a real psoas abscess. So if there's a real psoas abscess that would deserve antibiotics treatment and also some sort of drainage. So let's move on. Male 49 euro. This is the T1 weighted lumbar spine. The image that is fluid sensitive sequence. We see multiple abnormal marrow signal. So involving L1 through L5 early bodies and also S1. And these lesions are bright on fluid sensitive sequence. Any suggestion? Is it a benign or malignant finding? Does that look benign to you? If uh, so, it is a molecular lesion. So I was actually thinking about could this man have multiple schwannomas and also subsequent multiple marrow edema lesions. I was thinking about that, but then uh, this thing is too ugly. <laughs> this target lesion at S2. So so I was thinking about multiple bone metastasis. So what to do next? If we suspect multiple bone metastasis. Is a PET CT. So let's see, let's see the PET. So it's a mid image, whole body, showing the primary lesion in the lung, the right upper lobe. 
multiple lymph nodes lies up here, and also multiple bone lesion here, here, here. So what we saw on MRI are actually these tumor deposits in the bone. And the primary lesion is here in the web alone. How do we confer? We have to biopsy to get tissue diagnosis. So we should look at the easiest, most accessible sites to biopsy. It would be the left supraclavicular region, which is here. So these lymph nodes are readily available under ultrasound guidance for biopsy. So I did FMA, and this confirmed to be metastatic adenocarcinoma from lung primary. One more case, 40 year old female with history of breast cancer, and there's some abnormality in L5 vertebral body. So naturally, we think this is a metastasis that causes your back pain. So let's do a biopsy. So this is uh, what I did, CT guided biopsy. So this is the biopsy needle. This is the lytic lesion at L5. So the first pass, I took this core like uh, one, and a, one and a half centimeter long and then take another pass that is deeper, that is deeper. So that confirmed to be a stack lesion from ductal primary, that is CA breast, breast cancer. So the last modality would be CT. This guy, oh, this lady, 30 year old back pain. What is the cause of the pain? There's an arrow in the image. So this, this case is benign or malignant. It's probably benign, right? It's calcification causing causing pain. And what, what is that? What is this? What's the solution? It's the renal, it's a ureter stuff, yes. It's a renal stone that falls into the ureter and causing obstruction and causing hydronephrosis and also subsequent back pain. So Okay, if it's smaller than a centimeter, it is likely to pass out spontaneously. The smaller it is, the, the more likely it's going to pass out spontaneously. So these are all the interesting cases that I want to show and want to share with you guys. Is there any question for me? So everyone, you are welcome to turn on your mic now to ask any questions if you have any. I have a question about the um, filter again of the um, on the MRI. So, like all we are, <clears throat> we all know when we um, look at the cellulitis scar on the lateral cervical X-ray, we have a guide that like um, D would be like twelve millimeters, and then uh, I mean uh, the size of cellulitis scar should be uh, uh, smaller than twelve millimeter in deep and. 15 millimeter in length, we would consider as normal. So in MRI, like what size, or do we have any size guide we would consider it is abnormal or enlarged filter gland? Uh, usually we we'll take the X-ray, uh, the X-ray standard, uh -huh. like about 13 mm uh -huh. in size, and then one centimeter. Usually we, we, we take the limit of height to uh -huh. be less than this, uh -huh. or to than that is enlarged. Uh -huh. Mm 
question about those uh, benign findings, because we saw a lot of benign findings, yeah. and some of them are not causing any pain or symptom situation. Yeah. So some of, some of them you have said that uh, there is no need for follow up. Yes. But uh, in in uh, chiropractic care, we sometimes we take re X ray or follow up X ray for patients. Yes. Yeah. So um, so how long will it suggest us to like evaluate those benign findings? For example, like a tumor or a seed, they will probably get enlarged sometimes. Yes. So how long will it suggest us to like we we take the X rays or we evaluate the situation? So uh, the simple rule is uh, we we would have suggested that on the report okay. actually. Uh, and then it is in terms of uh, months or years, but then the, the, the determines on the, I mean, really depends on what type of uh, region we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if it's like a slow growing tumor, we would uh, recommend a longer follow up. Mm -hmm. If it's like a, like a potentially growing tumor, we um, recommend some short term follow up, like three months or mm -hmm. six months. Really depends, I uh, can't, mm -hmm. can't say. For sure, sure, like uh, what kind of around yeah. can the follow up. And it depends you know, on the what case, right? yes. yes. And of course, you are welcome to give me a call and we discuss mm -hmm. on uh, how we follow up the case and how we manage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also have another question because we've seen a lot of like pathology from uh, x ray or radio radiography uh, ordered by chiropractors. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in your opinions, you can just like share it. Uh, do you think this? important for chiropractor to take radiograph before seeing the patient? Or do you think it is like, it is necessary to take x-rays when you see a patient? Because sometimes it could be caused by muscle problem. But because uh, we see a lot of cases today, some of them are caused by like organs pathologies. Mm -hmm. So do you think it is like very important or is it necessary to for take x-rays or, or any kind of like, radiography? I think uh, if you're doing an X-ray for screening, you can look at the uh, spinal curvature, especially when using EOS, which is a very low dose, mm -hmm. low dose X-ray. So for screening purposes, I think it's a good practice uh, to look at the degree of curvature before and after your adjustment, mm -hmm. see uh, any uh, any improvement, and also look at the pelvic tilt. Right. Mm -hmm. so this is a good screening yeah. tours to use. Yeah. Uh, I would think so, and of course. MRI would be nice too, but then for the quick initial assessment, mm -hmm. I think uh, EOS would be a good, uh, would be a good option. Okay. Yeah. okay, we do have one question from the chat room in Zoom. Okay, Dr. Megan asks, for the last case of CT, what was the initial imaging that prompted a CT scan? I uh, really don't know, but then, uh, but then I got a case of CT referred by one of you guys, and uh, yeah, and I scratched my head. Was, Why would you guys refer CT? And mm -hmm. but then I found a email still. Okay. So, <laughs> any other question, guys? If you have any question, please turn on your mic. And yes. Okay, if that's all the questions, everything for oh, so a second. Okay, we do have another one. For some of the cases, what prompted an a, um, MRI instead of an X ray? And I'm supposed to observe any abnormality in X ray as well? I think uh, I don't expect uh, to see anything abnormal in X ray. Usually, uh, there's an initial X ray and then follow up by MRI instead of the first screening being MRI. Okay, so I do have another question I want to ask personally. Okay, so do you suggest we always take an X-ray before we take MRI or if we see something, let's say a bilateral arm and leg numbness, should we go straight to MRI or should we still take an X-ray before we do MRI? Um, I think it's really a matter of uh, personal practice and also the practice of the group. If, you, if you're talking about like bilateral upper limb and lower limb numbers, but we're thinking about something really central, or, or it could be some neuropathy, really depends on from case to case. Like 
if like a uh, rough um, I mean, it is like a DM, like diabetes, because uh, those patients could have numbness in the hands or also both feet. It would really depend on the clinical scenario, whether we should go X-ray or MRI first. It could also be other kind of neuropathy. It could also be B12 deficiency. So really you, you have to like take a good history and also do a physical examination before considering which kind of examination to proceed. Of course, there are definite uh, finding of uh, neuropathy on MRI, but then that would be like the whole spine screening plus contrast. It would be a, a bit uh, costly to the patient initially mm. if they are having this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Okay. Nothing? Good. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Sun, for the insightful and valuable um, seminar. It really teaches us a lot. So before we go, we do want to present a gift to you. Wow. <laughs> I don't want to think for a Okay. We really expect that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so very uh, <laughs> much appreciated this. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's take a picture. Thank you everyone for your time. Yep, thank you, thank you everyone. And before you go, we do have an other favor we want to ask of you. Um, every time. Um, when we do have a seminar, we usually hand out feedback forms. But since this year we have to do it online, we can only give you an online format um, of feedback form. So we are posting the link on the um, chat room right now. So if everyone can click on the link and fill in the um, form, that would be much appreciated. So thank you, Dr. Sam, for your time tonight. And everyone, have a good night. And stay healthy. Okay. 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 Okay.